They say you don't truly understand the value of something until you lose it. Only in depriving ourselves of the things we most take for granted do we learn their importance. I survived in Project Zomboid in a world whose flame was extinguished. Not only did the dead walk among the living, but the temperatures slowly dropped, ticking down day by day, until life support required layer upon layer of insulation. Yes, I'd need to carefully manage all the elements about me, or risk dying of exposure to the cold. On the first day, I spawned in before the coming of the storm. Naked, alone, and quite listless, without any real sense of place. I was the sole inhabitant of a cabin in the middle of the woods. No one, living or dead, was around me, and the loudest sound was the chirping of crickets, only three days before the eternal storm booted. Then the only sound I'd hear would be the roar of the wind through the trees. The cabin had a few objects of potential interest, among them a couple of radios with a few frequencies that generated a little static, and news about incoming cold weather but not much else. I decided to have a look around before venturing out of doors. The air was already frigid, and almost anything might help me. I gathered what supplies I could around me and returned them to the safety of my lodging, where I lit a fire in the hearth, preparing myself for the first short winter's nap. I decided to keep returning to this camp whenever time allowed, as it was remote, and it kept me safe from any roaming zombies. That night I slept, and there I dreamed the latest dream I ever dreamt. When I awoke, there was a tapping on the window. Disturbed, I rolled out of bed. And so it began there on the second day. That age-old fight of man versus wild. Or man versus man. So the nightmare began. Even if fought over by tooth and nail, it was a harrowing victory. The dead had made it to my little shelter in the woods in the middle of the night. A grand mystery. And so the first winds of that chilling winter blew into my very shelter in the woods. And there, I would be destined to sojourn, a stranger to myself in that very cabin. A swift flight would be the answer. I ventured forth. My assailant was, or had been, an animal trapper out camping in the woods until the virus claimed him. Nearby, domestic fixtures such as the outhouse were cause for concern, and greater trepidation wandering this new hostile landscape. But logically, it followed that there must be more trappers nearby. So I sought out their camp in the morning twilight. I was a scavenger, and each victory or discovery was another stepping stone toward escaping a life of being marooned, lost in that cabin in the woods. Sure enough, my next adversaries were, or had been in their previous lives, trappers, resting at a camp. With a blade, my swings were clean and true. This meant a surfeit of supplies looking ahead. The next question was, would it be north, east, south, or west? The answer didn't really matter, whichever one you pick. Just stick to your decision and don't fear off the path. Or you could just be lost forever. It was essential that I take myself to a location with greater infrastructure or I might be lost in the woods for far longer than I'd care to be out here, especially at the start of the storm. Developing a keen sense of direction when you're off venturing through the woods is a habit vital to life. Natural landmarks like roads are a lifesaver. Lucky that I found one, and I found a lot more than just that. Two passengers lost control in an overturned vehicle. Dead, alive, or somewhere in between, I scavenged what I needed. Many of my items were torn and frayed from venturing through the wilderness. The trunk, unfortunately, was locked. The bodies, I found reanimated, even after some delay discovering them. I disposed of the corpses, but I'd been out in the woods too long. At only 10 degrees, things weren't looking good out here. I sought shelter inside. Staying outdoors too long is taxing on the body. Nearly spent, I fought a few of the prior inhabitants, but for the most part, I simply calculated what positioning would lend me the best tactical advantage, or chanced evasion whenever no opportunity at a swift kill arose. I knew I needed heat more than anything else. The longer I stayed out in the cold, the more tenuous my chances. By nightfall, I stealthily maneuvered back to the house and cracked open the window into a temporary shelter, practically a womb unto itself. But for now, it would preserve life and hope along with it. Two days out in the cold and the overgrown wild, overtaken by nature and the virus, 
The worst was behind me, but the air temperatures would certainly keep dropping, and dropping to a lethal sub-zero. But that was all ahead. The next day, I embarked once again on my journey, now determined to make the most of every option, and weave my way through the right decisions to stay alive. Though the air was getting colder and the storm was clearly imminent, one home nearby was an easy opportunity I snatched at greedily. Only one inhabitant, and he was facing just the right direction for me to enter and leave quietly. There wasn't much in the house, so I made my way right on. When you can identify all of civilization's landmarks, you'll know you're headed in the right direction. Finally, I spotted a river, and along with it, a path. At the end of which, I chanced upon a cabin in the woods. Another one, like the one I had originated at, but this one featured a little more activity. I was improving, but I couldn't shake the feeling that someone or something was watching me, lying in wait for me to drop my guard. I took glory in my good fortune and tidied my surroundings. A clear space would make for a clear mind, and I'd been out of doors for days, not just cabins. I needed a more stable shelter in which to take up lodging, or else give way to the madness that is nature, with or without the undead there. After a little cleaning and organizing of all the things I had accumulated, I went to bed. The thin veneer of the wall blocked out the entropic forces of nature, ever creeping closer and sullying all that I'd built up for self-preservation and more high-minded activities. After a little more consideration, I decided that I was safe and went to bed earlier today, and I wiped off a bead of sweat in relief. Three full days, I awoke in the dark. The morning's first light brought foraging and more outdoor time. I was quickly becoming a man of the woods, and the uncertainty of nature that had first sent chills down my spine was now a peaceful recess from the mind's constant chatter. Sure enough, leaving the woods behind, there loomed a well-groomed mansion. Now giving way to the tendrils of ivy reclaiming the lonely structure, I made my way inside. There were a few inhabitants. I thought it most prudent to quietly dispatch them one by one by calling out. A fluke, but it could have easily meant my life. Shock led to adrenaline, and adrenaline allowed me to fight like I never had before. I vetted the rest of the house, made company now only by the eerie hum and creak of household fixtures and appliances. This house in particular was a rare one for rural Kentucky, being outfitted with a second floor. This turned out to be a vital layer of defense from the dead, and with room for a view. During these quiet moments, I took account of my good fortune, and the snow seemed more a thing of beauty than a threat to life. And so the onslaught of winter began with a childish note of nostalgia. The simple act of collecting and taking inventory of my supplies quieted the uproarious thoughts and fears that raged over my mind like a storm. I was a master of my tools, and in that idea I took great comfort. When you don't have a home, a backpack is like a small piece of one to carry with you. And I strode away keepsakes I found as I went searching through those buildings. Eventually, I came to find that the cul-de-sac community, though certainly outfitted with a plethora of modern amenities, was not actually as secure as it first appeared, with doors hanging ajar in unexpected places. But there was lots to explore, and I took comfort in the fact that I had secured a garage for housing a vehicle when I eventually found one. There's nothing quite like the pregnant feeling of anticipation at the start of a storm. I busied myself and probed each of the residences for an opening. I got lucky and made my way inside, searching the cabinets and dispatching of the previous residents, much like I did in the last houses, taking inventory at every corner of what could and couldn't help me, and most of it could not help me. There's something liberating about the notion of the apocalypse in that all sense of private property vanishes. Everything becomes shared, signaling a return to that great ancient hunter-gatherer way of life, and it's the great social equalizer my only enemy was the temperature outside, and how many layers I could put between me and it. I took myself back inside and found the fireplace, made a trip back out to forage for some wood, and started a fire in the hearth. As the heat of the crackling fire diffused into my bones, relief washed over me and soothed my spirit, and I basked in the glow of the warm embers until it was time to turn in for bed at the end of the night. The storm raged on through the night, and as I slumbered, the flakes fell faintly and amassed into a thick white blanket over the once familiar rooftops of that cul-de-sac, making of it one gray identity, a mere blemish in the face of those nameless woods. 
I ventured out of doors at that mysterious hour no one can tell because the snow illuminates the air itself. The shadows of all my struggles yesterday were now fading into memory, and a new world of challenge and subsistence stretched before me like a track. And so there, in the pale morning light of the fifth day, I trekked across the familiar landscape of Americana, now quieted and reclaimed by winter. The walk was short but peaceful, and led me to the outskirts of a village, where I began to sense the familiar signs of the dead, still ever-present, and ever a threat to remain alert to. For the moment you let your guard down may be your last. Stifled in my methods, I made my way quietly through a collection of sheds, dotting the periphery, and tiptoed my way quietly into town. Neutralizing threats in my path, and keeping a clear exit plan, in case danger should rear its ugly head. I carved a neat path through town, delicately avoiding hordes, but dispatching a few lonely souls. The air was now so clouded with cold vapor that the sun was still blotted out, even at midday. Making my way deeper, I found that the dead were too great in number to chance any looting runs this day, and I needed a vehicle to allow me to safely travel farther from my home. Otherwise, my world would keep growing smaller and darker every day. The storm raged, and I sought shelter wherever it was available, on the periphery of the town. At dawn on the sixth day, the town was under assault. A blizzard had blown in during the night. Conveniently, the storm provided ample cover for snaking my way back into town, and I had already cleared much of the path the previous day, so it meant only a few brawls in the graveyard of the village church before I could infiltrate the town. In the lot, I spied an abandoned ranger truck. After a few attempts fumbling through the compartment, I was able to hotwire the vehicle. And so before noon on the sixth day, I drove back through the intensity of the blizzard, leaving red stains in the snow, and I made my way west toward home and safe lodging. Isolation, really, from the threat. After I parked my car, I sat a while and considered all my options and everything I had already done. Sure, I was safe from the cold for now, but the next step was to barricade my home and make it safe harbor from the dead outside in case I should ever have to hole up in here for an extended period of time. I got to work. Everything could be used to barricade my home. The trees had provided food before, now it was shelter. I sawed the logs from nearby into planks and boarded up the windows one by one. When I felt like the structure was secure from the outside, I began disguising my presence on the inside to make it look abandoned fashioning curtains from sheets, and draping them over the windows to hide my activity within. Lastly, I created an escape route in case of emergency by hanging a sheet rope from the window of my bedroom. The corpses I gathered, and outside I placed them in a pile, probably to remain on display for a few months given the cold temperatures. And to make it extra safe, I pushed all of the furniture in front of the windows. My shelter was safe and sound. I had finally checked all of those mental checkboxes and the inclination to grow worried and paranoid was beginning to drop. Now I could fully take comfort in the glow of the fire and the comfort of a well-made bed. But that night, first it came with a whirring, then a distinct chopping, and when I opened the window, there it was in plain sight. The horde had come in the night, and the folly of my ways was instantly evident. Hindsight is 2020, and in a swift flurry of motions, I fought back the entropic forces of fate and sped away. My shelter compromised, the doors and windows being clawed away by cadavers. I checked with relief that the walls were not yet fallen. I searched or clawed my own way back to my vehicle, for it would be many, many miles before I could sleep.